one fingering weight yarn uh, called Lima and it's an alpaca, a wool and alpaca mix and there's another type of yarn that is going to be combined um, kid silk mohair silk mohair and the project requires to start with uh, two alpaca strands for um, neckband and we'll, we'll cast on using that so you can join in on the entire process and see how I would go about it, I guess. For privacy reasons, I, I can't share the pattern because you usually have to purchase it. So I, I won't be showing exactly what, you know, steps and so on, but um, I, I hope you can follow along, just join along with your own project and we can work on it together. And so, so the project is, um, uh, a balaclava for a small kid, um, starting with a ribbed face band, um, you know, which is going to be worked with two strands of merino hold together, or in this case, alpaca. Um, pull both, uh, pulling both sides and uh, at the cen center end, and uh, to make two strands. And I'm using three millimeter needles, um, even if the, the, the pattern requires three and a half, but. I have a looser knit, so my gauge is slightly different, and I'm gonna cast on 84, 96, I guess. Uh, so. Cool, 96. Using the long tail cast on method. So, okay, I'm just making sure I have plenty left. And I like to put two needles together because for some reason I cast on very tightly. So this helps me to bypass that by using two needles at the same time. Okay, so 90, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 20. gonna go off 50 so 51 52 53 54 
76, 77, 78, 79, 80, whoops, 80, 80, 12 more, okay, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12. It's like counting little sheeps, you know, before you go to sleep. <laughs> Can you see why knitting is maybe a bit relaxing? So now the slightly tricky part is to get it all out, which can be a bit of a struggle. So I think I just need to take it all out. One one needle needs to come out. So oops. So one needle still needs to hold all of the cast ons. Okay, so I kind of gonna grab one needle and then Pull another one. Just a bit of creativity sometimes. Okay, so one is pulled out, one is still there. I think I have all the cast ons. Um I'm gonna cast on I'm gonna cast take take the one off and I'm gonna cast off that one additional that I just casted off. And I'm gonna cast one more to join in the round. So, whew, we made it! Always feels like an achievement to just have your cast on. Um, okay, I'm just gonna double check my needles are all in place. I'm using Pronova needles to make sure I'm reusing cables and just using different needles. I kind of don't like buying loads of pairs of needles and reusing feels more efficient, but they do unscrew sometimes. So. Okay, so now I'm gonna try to join in the round, which is another slightly tricky task sometimes if your loop is a bit too long. Um, okay, so just have to stretch, stretch over all the all the needles, making sure that there's no twist before joining. That's important. Just mindful to join it without the twist. So. There you go, everything looks like facing the same side. Okay, now it's kind of... So I'm gonna move, take my dominant needle. Your dominant needle will be re right hand or left hand. But I'm gonna use neutral language. So take your dominant needle, the one you use to knit. And... Um, sorry, take your non-dominant needle in this case. Sorry, dominant. <laughs> Take the loop from non-dominant needle, non-dominant, and with your non-dominant needle, pick up one loop from the dominant needle. Okay, just tighten things all, all things up, and taking that loop over and bringing the the, the um, bringing the first loop back to the non-dominant non-dominant needle. Hope this makes sense. Okay, I think we're ready to start the work. So the loop is joined with a little um, eyelet going over. So there's very minimal gap. Um, so the next step will be joining work in the round and not twisting, placing the beginning of, beginning of round. I like to use the tail as the beginning of the round just for first one or two rounds. And now we are going into setup round. So knit two and purl two. I okay, the pattern asks for knit one, purl one, but I love the two, the, the knit two purl two ribbed rib so I'm gonna just go for that so knit 
knit 2 and purl 2 knit 2 and purl 2 so the first round is usually quite tight because the cast on is the long tail cast on is not so super flexible so it takes a little while at least i find it that it does even with the double needle i just doubling up the needles when i cast on i just find it still keeps it a bit tight and the first round at i don't know from with it feels like a struggle for me at least and and it's much slower than the uh, the following rounds um, and the pattern was explicit to use a longer longer loop anyway so I could have picked the, uh, a loop that's slightly shorter and then all the needles would all the um, loops would be quite tightly together but then I would have troubles to like cast cast on with double needle for you know so it's a give and take I guess okay let's see two by two moving to knit two knit two and make sure we move it along and and yeah adjustments so that's just required requirement yeah, the first loop is usually a quite uh, tight one. So, uh, the, 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 this series as always has a, a topic in the background. Um, I'll keep the chat to minimal while I'm doing something where it requires to focus quite intensely. But when there's like repetition work, like going through loads of stockinette stitches, I will cover the topic so you can also knit along and listen to chatter <laughs> about a topic a particular topic and the one today is about seven habits of highly effective people it's the book that I've read ten years ago but also I'm I am re listening so hopefully you've uh, come across it by written by Stephen Covey it's the the title sounds cheesy but it's actually a very old book and they've released many editions but I think it's on the fourth of edition um, and it's kind of the or orig origin of all the seven habits or five habits or you know seven steps or whatever um, those program sounding books and you know seven habits of highly effective uh, people is the you know written by you know, a long time ago, I think 10 or 15 or 20 years, something like that. And he's quite, Stephen Covey is quite a famous business advisor. And also I think he was a priest or um, a preacher or, um, a, you know, um, Christian priest or preacher. So his background is kind of interesting. Um, feels like someone who has the business mentality, but also has the kind of spiritual or like, you know, angle as well, which I find that one without the other is quite skewed and you don't get a full picture or like a, a wholesome profile of, of an advice. So anyway, I read it 10 years ago and I found it hugely impactful, like I was 21 at the time. I found it impactful for my career, but also outside of my career, just the way it was written, advice and just not only made sense, but was... Um, yeah, just elaborated nicely and on and the writing style was clear and you can you can tell th th there was this efficiency as well just about how the book is written so i actually highly recommend the book itself if you can just read it or listen to it on on as audiobook in the background while you're knitting and yeah that's kind of what i do when i'm knitting it's my that's how i started knitting actually i just wanted to uh, listen to more books or consume more books because I find myself not reading them as much anymore due to less commute commuting hours than in the past so I started knit I was like oh, I need to maybe listen to more books and when I'm walking I can't seem to hear what the, book, the content is about so I found that knitting made it 
made it make me can't focus enough uh, you know had enough focus on well, what's the chat in the background as you probably already know as well yourself like you I imagine you you, you like to knit while watching TV or listening for TV in the background but I don't find uh, the television super useful or nourishing anymore and um, books seem more nourishing but there's something super enjoyable about just chatter in the background and you know I, I sometimes join knitting evenings uh, with my local community in London Richmond Richmond London and I just like knitting while there's this lovely chatter in the background so I hope you will also enjoy that and you can you, you can feel that you can join along and um, listen to this chatter like I said um, feel free to give me tips as well if you would like to see maybe uh, th this view of what I'm knitting or the view of you know me just also knitting and talking or maybe both I could I could introduce another view where you know <laughs> it's filming my face so <laughs> yeah just let me know um, if you don't like it just don't watch it and don't leave bad comments like it's okay I, I know it's not for everyone so it, it's fine <laughs> um, so I guess the format is like always one hour of knitting um, let me check if we're still one hour of knitting and different project or the same project uh, we are on 16 minutes uh, 17 minutes so so you can also like see how much can this get gets done um, while you know in that one hour how much you can achieve I guess and with your knit projects and maybe what is realistic I I'm gonna say I'm just well I am told to be a fast knitter but I don't know if I'm fast knitter um, I, I do knit like irregularly I would say but there's a lot of output I do I do say so uh, that a lot of people said that oh wow you knitted four you know six things in four months that's a lot I, I don't know I don't know how much how productive others are so maybe I'm a fast knitter maybe I'm a slow knitter I don't know but in one hour this is what we, we can achieve I guess together um, I already had you know you saw me have nothing and then in one hour we'll it's been 20 minutes and let's see what what how much we have after the full one hour finishes right so so yeah so hopefully you'll get also uh, an encouragement or like a, a view of how much can be done in one hour um, usually good patterns also indicate how much time it might take you to knit a project and there's like a whole fashion of slow knitting, fast knitting. Um, slow knitting obviously is a bit more encouraged because we're getting more sustainable, I guess. Uh, hey, I'm on my last eye. Okay, so so let's see what's going on here. <laughs> Looks like I have two, no, one. Maybe? Hmm. So last one. Yay, we finished the round. Nice. I think now it's gonna go quicker. So now it's gonna go quicker because I can also just see the pattern and follow what is established. So it looks like I made a few mistakes even at the beginning. Anyways, <clears throat> let's see. Okay. So continuing on. So I'm gonna continue with the rib pattern. I'm still gonna use the long tail um, as the beginning of round so I like to do that for first few t or, you know two or three rounds and then I introduce the beginning of round because I, th I find it super obvious where the beginning of round is at the beginning okay following the rib so maybe go I'll, I'll start to go into the topic of this knit along uh, which is the seven habits of highly fish uh, effective people and maybe you can use that in your knitting on other other areas or Get inspired to. Um, let me just see what was done here. Looks like. <coughs> okay. Three 
pearls for some reason. Hmm. Four pearls. Hmm. So I think this should be knit. So I'm doing a few eyelets. Okay. Two knits. Two knits. Two pearls. That's the rib pattern I chose to go for. I think I find two rib two by two rib pattern really cute. One by one is fine, but maybe it looks a little less pronounced. But I just don't find it so cute. Anyways, for kids I think it might be fun to use. Okay, so one um, example that stuck with me throughout the years. I remember when, when I read it at the time I was 21 and it kind of blew my mind. Uh, because pff, at 21 I didn't know how everything joined, how everything worked together the dependencies and so on so to me it was like a big surprise you know some of the things that he mentioned so I'll just say that personally I remember finding the whole um, there was this advice that you know building trust with your colleagues or friends or in your personal life trust inevitably leads to love and I found that really peculiar because I, I definitely heard about the vice versa like you can't if the trust is broken you can't love um, or like it you know relationships if the trust is broken you can't um, foster lov loving feelings anymore or like the relationship ends even so I heard about that but I never heard that if you establish a trust a trusting relationship with your colleagues your friends uh, you know people you do work out together or something it results inevitably in love so you know not, not necessarily obviously romantic love but still I uh, I, f I found that big news to me and it kind of stuck to, with me with through the years like I tried to apply it you know in my work like if someone would confide in me I would make double sure that I, I would not slip slip it out you know slip on it and t t tell others or or like if someone you know said something then I would I would just I became conscious and aware and, and you know in the last 10 years I I, th I think it just became part of my DNA like and you know there's a lot of people like who I, I experience having trusting relationship with at work um, and a lot of people who like stayed in touch after you know parting our ways and so on so so that was one advice that personally you know resonated with me and I, I think at the time I was uh, kind of abroad and you know studying and working by myself and kind of entered the workforce and was also just an expat or foreigner you could say from <clears throat> in Britain and I, I just didn't I felt like I needed you know any boost <laughs> I could get to make it work here because I didn't feel like there's a lot of family or friends or like everyone like helping or you know I didn't have a guarantee that it's gonna work out with with career or like you know you know in, on the insecure days and in insecure days I would think I mean why should they be bothered to help me like why should they want to help um, someone from Lithuania you know <laughs> like from Baltics like they don't know me I don't they're not my family my friends like I mean I was a 21 year old girl and luckily you know just cute smart you know all that tried my best but you know th that advice gave me assurance that if I foster trust trusting relationships at work and everywhere it's gonna lead, lead to to love and connection and, you know I'm gonna kind of root root in and so yeah that was kind of huge personally to me and I learned in that book you know I say it in a short phrase like that but there was a whole section about it I don't remember which advice it led to specifically but it was definitely in one of the seven advice so so the, the habits that he says in in the order of sort of you know sequence um, that kind of build on to each other is be pro being proactive uh, begin beginning with the end in mind putting th first things first, thinking win-win, and um, seeking first to understand, then to be understood, um, you know, 
number six would be synergy synergies creating synergy number seven being sharpen the saw <clears throat> so I don't know um, I, I probably won't give like very thorough one by one bullet point overview of each step looks like there was a power cut or something uh, so we are on row uh, number let's see one two three four so we have three more rows uh, and we have about 40 more minutes so 30 more minutes something like that and just continuing to maybe talk about seven habits of highly effective people um, just a quick recap of what those seven habits um, he covers about it covers uh, in the book um, you know first one is be proactive second one is beginning with the end in mind third one is put first things first fourth one is think win-win fifth one is seek first to understand and then to be understood sixth is uh, synergy synergize and seventh is sharpen your soul so um, I think it might be interesting to focus on the ones that um, are sort of relevant to knitting knitting world a little bit so maybe being proactive um, I guess as, as knitters it's an interesting one because well some some of you might feel like you want to take the next step and maybe become bolder in your projects or maybe you want to go out there into the community or markets or maybe even monetize on what you're doing and or, or um, just create more joy and more relaxed feelings like and, and, and you know battled anxieties of like help others to find a like way to get get through it or whatever so I guess what it says there in the book is that we're in charge and we choose the scripts by which we live our lives you know using the self-awareness to be proactive and take responsibility for our choices you know um, basically we're not victims or we're not we, we can choose to be um, radically um, um, accountable or radically kind of um, well, proactive, I guess. And what this thing, you know, they say, he says there that you know what distinguishes our, distinguishes us as humans from all the other animals and our inherent ability is that our inherent ability to examine our own characters and decide how to view ourselves and our situations and to control our own <laughs> effectiveness uh, basically to order to be effective we, you know we must in order to be effective we must be proactive so you know reactive people take a passive stance like they believe that you know that the world is happening to them and they're a victim they're at and at the end of you know receiving end like they can't change anything and actually they you know they would say like there's nothing I can do or that's just the way I am or it, it's not gonna work or like this is how it is I'm, I'm just at peace with it now and they think they outsource the problems they say the problem is uh, something else someone else or somehow else you know so and I guess if you want to be like more um, you know and, and, and indeed like it's like it's this victimized stance and you know feeling out of control and I guess what he suggested that being more proactive step is that we can take ownership of our actions to say okay if I'm at I'm being a victim and I'm not doing anything about it then I'm a little bit at, at blame here I'm kind of consenting to being a victim here so you know and proactive uh, people actually recognize they have responsibility and res you know response ability as you know Kavi says so we we have um, you know which which is like he defines as uh, ability to choose how we will respond to a given st you know stimulus or situation so it so in order to be proactive we we have to you must focus on circle of influence so what can, we can control and you know the things we can control and things we can change and we, we can only control the controllables basically so you can 
you, you can't change the weather but you can change what you're wearing you know you can take an umbrella so you can't change the character of your boss but you can change your response you can't change the way your bone structure is but you can choose how you're using your shader shading you know <laughs> or like what kind of shapewear you're wearing or like like what kind of knitwear you're wearing you know so um you know i guess key lessons is that you know challenge yourself to test the principle of proactivity and by doing the, you know some of the things like start replacing reactive language you know with proactive language so you know for example you know reactive being he makes me mad and you know, proactive i control my responses you know i i you know instead of he makes me mad you say i choose just to get upset you know immediately like without one second's delay or I choose it so I can choose something else instead um, you know con convert reactive tasks into proactive tasks so I guess oh you know I'm running out of like time or whatever like not sure what example good example could be reactive task like mm, oh, I'm picking up the phone because everyone is calling me I'm replying to all the emails but you know, you could choose a practice task like, um, I don't know, you put a timer on and, and in that timer you, you reply to emails and then you have the rest of the time for yourself and you kind of try to go, get through as much as you can, but that's as much as you can do or something. I'm, I'm not giving a good example here, but hopefully it's... Um, another point... Um, um, that he talks about that I liked and I'm not gonna cover all seven but um, for example he says in point three is put the first things first and I think we as humans we, we, we sort of overlook it a bit and I in my experience I deal with this a bit as well every day like he says in order to manage ourselves effectively we must put first things first as in we must have discipline to prioritize our day uh, to day tasks um, uh, and actions based on what is most important not as what not what is most urgent so you know in habit number two he discussed importance of determining the you know our values and understanding of what is uh, what it is that we are setting out to achieve so i guess having an end in mind is the point number two which i haven't chatted through about here but just quickly undo this little edit. Oh, it was fine actually. <laughs> you know, um, ha habit number three is about going after these goals, the most important goal, uh, these goals and executing our, on our priorities day to day, moment to moment basis, meaning executing most important tasks, not the most urgent ones. The most urgent tasks get the most too much attention already. So, you know, whatever is your maybe most important in your knitting or knitting projects or knitting intentions like maybe you also want to take it into next step so just make sure that you know you're also focusing on the most important tasks along that goal and not the tasks that are more urgent like let's say you know i have a choice of two tasks run to yarn shop get more yarn that i already have a lot of or you know create a page my own blog page or web page or Instagram page where I can start to post my knitting diary so which one is more urgent which one is more important like or you know so you, you'll be the judge there but um, let's just see so I'm on row number one two three four five six seven it's the last row we're doing the last I'm doing the last row so and in the habit put first first things first is he says you know, in order to maintain the, the discipline and the focus to stay on track towards the goal, um, we need to have like the willpower to do something um, we don't want to do. Um, we need to act according to our values, uh, value system rather than our desires or impulses, because urgency is kind of tapping into impulses, I guess, rather than our value and, and sort of mental priorities. Um, And uh, yeah, he covers that uh, it and like, you know, ha thinking about these tasks or that lead to your goal according to four quadrants, which he says are, are urgent, not urgent, like um, 
important or not important. So any given task could be urgent and important. It could be urgent but not important. It could be not urgent but important. Or not urgent and not important. So obviously we shouldn't spend no time on not urgent, not important tasks like getting extra yarn, which we already have a lot of. Uh, let's see. And then obviously he wants us to be more spending time on the urgent and important as well as not urgent but important tasks because they are kind of the highest value biggest bang for the buck tasks so um i hope this makes sense it, it definitely makes sense to me like we are all guilty of just doing busy work busy work like urgent work and not enough of very important urgent work or just important work in general or like blocking out time or scheduling time to work on you know a bit of a you know create a bit of space to just focus on the tasks that are the, the highest value tasks rather than the highest pressure least 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 time left tasks whatever um yeah maybe this is boring but i just feel like that advice is so uh, makes such a big difference if you start doing it and really doing it <laughs> you know important things um another advice is like no, point number four like thinking win-win um where he says like in order to establish effective and in you know relationships we must commit to um creating win-win situations and 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 solutions that's you know satisfy the, each, each party so and I guess he doesn't mean it in a compromise compromise way he means it's in a win-win solution so like you know he explains, explains that there are like six paradigms of human interaction like um, both people win and like you know number one both people win and agreements uh, or situations are mutually beneficial and satisfying to both parties you know you know there's like win-lose lose-win lose-lose uh, one side wins or like but but he advocates that the best approach is like either go for a win-win or no deal so if you if, if there isn't absolutely a way to both sides to get this you know satisfactory achievement it's better to go for no deal rather than compromise and win or compromise compromise or whatever like um and it says like the best option to create win-win situations is um, putting putting the putting the goals and results of other person and your your um, like very clearly outlining first understanding those very clearly what does the win definition look like for you what does it look like for another person and then going from there. Um, and you know that alone takes a lot of time because we, I think we tend to like we tend to be very clear of what we want but we don't spend a lot of time understanding and listening to what other side wants we just like tend to like rush and justify but but you can't want that you know because I want this and you know you don't be, you know whatever so we just don't empathize with the other side's uh, kind of definition of win or like success um so i guess some of the key lessons is that you know thinking about upcoming interactions and w what are you going to talk about and maybe starting to think what the other person or another party what would they want might want and identifying three important um you know key important relationships in your life that you'd want to create these win-wins or you know for me like as a product designer at work i try to create what i call like win 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 so meaning you know product design you have to make something that the end user likes or really wants to use and also stakeholders get their vision fulfilled like and the team who implemented and executed also you know wins because they've learned all but a whole bunch of um successful useful tools uh, methods attitudes so you know they worked on something that became a success and um, 
high value lesson for them and so on. Um, so let's just have a look. So I, I think I reached a one, two, three, four, five, and six. Oh, really? No, no, let's count. One, two, three, four, five, six. Huh. One more round. One, two, three, four, five. What? One, two. Two, three, four, five, six, seven. Mm -hmm. So I think I reached the required number of rows. This is how it looks like. Okay, we've had this achieved in half an hour. Half an hour, one step is done. Um, now we're moving to crown shaping and crown, crown has begun in rib pattern and it continues in stockinette stitch with short rows and increases to, to increase the shaping so next stitches are then placed on hold and work um, continues back and forth uh, working double stitches as the first stitch uh, as the first stitch throughout throughout so this is german short rows um set up you know, we're gonna, I'm gonna start with setting up the short rows. Um, you know, right side, working 74 stitches, no, 70 stitches in rib pattern as established. So break one, breaking one of the merino. Okay, so breaking one of the merino strand and joining one strand of silk mohair. So, okay, so this gray little bandana. Oops. I just gonna need to rip it. Okay, and then replace it with wait. Okay, let's just see what happened. Okay, so silk silk more hair comes in. It's silk, I'm using it's silk. <sighs> back. So I will join the kit silk. beginning round um, okay, I'm just gonna work with 70 70 stitches so I'll count count together so one two Thirty-one, thirty-two, thirty-three, thirty-four, 
So many I need. Seventy. Okay. Good. Okay. Knit one. We now need to knit one and place marker. Okay. So. Let's use place marker. So this is getting important to place markers when it's not the beginning of round, as we know. It's gonna help guide along the project or pattern. And here I might want to also place beginning of round. So kind of neatening up the project, I guess. Neatening, neatening up. So let's see. So beginning of round was here. I'm gonna place it here. There. And I like to use a different looking and feeling, just completely different um, yeah, marker, which this one's become my favorite, little bubble. And um, just use a color marker. Nice. Okay, so Okay, knit one place marker and then we're turning back so short rows short rows okay short row wrong side um, now we're just gonna quickly read some abbreviations in the pattern so DS means double stitch Okay, all good. Just a short stop to make sure the abbreviations mean what I think they do. Okay, crown shaping, crown shaping. Short rows, turning, turned work. DS, just check again. Yes, is double stitch. Hmm. Double stitch. But hmm, the, setting up the first round. So you see, like reading patterns is a bit like that. Double stitch for German short bro technique. Okay. There's nothing to double stitch at the moment. Right. So. Pearl to beginning of round. Okay, we just turned work. So we turned work. All right. So I think how it works is you have. Okay, we bring the yarn forward. We pick up the first stitch. Yep. And then we take the yarn over, like so, over the needle. And it kind of goes behind the 
stitch and then we just continue bring that yarn forward for purling and just purling to beginning of round and now we have the beginning of round so we can just purl and <laughs> purl and shut okay so just purling till the beginning of round um, yeah so just carrying on I guess on the seven habits of highly effective people um, another another step is uh, step number five where he says uh, seek first to understand and then to be understood and you know before we can uh, offer advice or anything I guess um, you know so, you know suggest solutions effectively um, he says that we should interact with one you know another person in a way that we must seek to deeply understand their thoughts reasons uh, perspective and through empathetic listening and you know unfortunately we do the same thing kind of we, we did this we did this thing where we don't you know listen we sort of want to be heard first and that's it's okay we, we, we do need to be heard he says but we, we kind of overlook the listening and um, part listening actively and you know there's basically like a notion that high quality communication can only happen in high quality listening so yeah he goes quite a lot about you know seeking first to understand and then to be understood and the impact that could have I thought that was brilliant advice um, and just technique and you know again it's something that I maybe come across a bit more just at the, the, the type of field I, I personally deal with and work in you know product development product design learning about user users what do they need and what do stakeholders need what my project manager needs to be built and it's kind of kind of seeking to understand is kind of the ba the basics of my, my my delivery work because I'm sort of not the imposer of needs but the receiver of what others need like users stakeholders pms so but yeah that advice i think makes sense and i personally have always find that high quality communication can only happen in high quality listening so it's not about how much you say but how much other can others hearing and how unbiased this listening is like and so on um and what the last advice in the step number seven he talks about uh, sharpening the saw which I think applies to us knitters so much you know he says like to be effective we must devote the time to renewing ourselves spiritually physically and mentally and socially and our skills as well like renewing and investing in them you know continuous renewal allows us to synergistically increase ability to practice each habit but also the skills that we we do every day um, Habit number five is focused around renewal uh, and taking time to sharpen the saw. So, you know, learning something once and then 10 years you don't revisit it or, or you don't enter the beginner mindset again and you just approach from a place of knowing it all or something maybe else. This could also be a problem. Um, and he talks there a lot about um, enhancing the uh, ultimate asset that matters, which is yourself uh, enhancing you know really if the house burns down and you, your husband or another other half leaves or or so on like you're not gonna lose yourself in a way like so you're ultimately the only asset that kind of matters so investing time in yourself and mental health and or skill sets or approaches that you might have um, yeah so these were all of the advice that he had in there um, I didn't do them justice at all I only also picked just a few but yeah so let's see we just reached the beginning of round uh, we're gonna short row yeah short row number three double stitch so let's see the beginning of round turn work returning work Double stitch. This, so I think that's what it means. You bring the yarn forward. We pick the this uh, one eyelet, and we place the yarn back over it. Over it. 
so like sort of neatly behind it. Knit three. from the back, knit it, and then knit three. One, two, three. Um, with your dominant needle, put it uh, over the non-dominant needle, knit it, and knit one, two, three. Or we could say grab with your non-dominant needle from behind that's M that that's the leaning left and then knit it and knit one two and three right so we can grab it from the back knit knit it knit one two three Okay, and then make one left again, uh, and then one, two, three. Grabbing from the from behind, knitting, and then one. So this is kind of the repeat. Knit, make one left, knit three. Is the repeat they ask for in the pattern? dominant needle, dominant needle knits the new stitch and then knit three. Knit three. Kind of and you know goes to the end of the round almost but with these kind of busier rounds I kind of try to keep myself focused because they do require some you know they require you know attention to not miss the 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 pattern so just kind of checking in so i made one i still need to knit one more because we're doing we're working in the short rows um knitting in the round usually the knit goes from the front usually but because we're knit purling from you know doing short rounds you need to knit from the back, back, back of the stitch. So, for example, okay, I'll just do the make one left, make one left, and then I'll knit from grabbing the back, the back of the loop. It basically creates a straight stitch and not a twisted stitch. Um, I just found that after a while, so. Um, when you usually knit in the round, like stuck in a stitch, it usually becomes twisted naturally so that you can only grab the front loop. But with short rows, you're doing, when you do the purl, you have to go through the back. So to keep the st stitches straightened, like straight like this, um, and not look like they're twisted. 
um, and it just creates a different look like actually quite a different look so um, I would say these um, small adjustments make a huge difference for how the finished work looks like like I at the beginning I didn't used to notice it and just go for it like and sometimes switch around like grab the front loop grab the back loop and I was like well is it gonna make a big difference I thought maybe not but yeah unfortunately knitting like you might know every adjustment makes a difference in the end result like end look um, so these nuances I guess they kind of matter so okay so I knitted one um, make one left and knit knit three two three right so and it's gonna be like that until to the last stitches before marker okay two marker before marker so just continue so this is uh, an increasing round uh, we're gonna <clears throat> okay so this is kind of finished for you know this stretch of knitting which was roughly two hours so as you see um, you know we you know, cast it on created a rib two by two rib and a whole set of short rows so german short rows meaning knitting um, incomplete rounds for a while um, to create this sort of uh, very um, undefined edge versus much thicker and more like layers at the top um, so yeah so kind of shaping shaping part um, like i said i'm following a pattern so I'm just going according to the instructions but this is how much I managed to knit for of baklava so I think it would fit over uh, my nephew's little face so that's where his face would go and that's where his neck will go and that's little shaping around the forehead here and the sides and then there will be the little bit under the chin and the neck so kind of next session next one hour of knitting we'll have the further like further along the process so i hope you enjoyed the topic and i hope you enjoyed the one hour knit uh, next time round it will be another topic and we'll we'll just continue with this uh, balaklava project for my little nephew so uh, subscribe and like and share and I'll see you next time